uh, in here in physically in presence or I guess remotely somewhere around the world. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to uh, um, introduce to you uh, Jose Onucic, who is visiting from University of Rice University. Um, he's the director of, of the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics at the Rice University, and is the uh, Olga uh, Harry Olga Vice uh, Professor of Physics and Astronomy, Chemistry and Bioscience at Rice University. Uh, just to make a very short introduction to Jose, I would say that he probably can be considered one of the founding father of modern theoretical biology and uh, biophysics. Is really his contribution to the understanding of protein folding is uh, really at the fundamental level with the introduction. You can see there the, the funnel picture that is the, the representation of what our current understanding of how protein folds. And all these, all the theories that he developed during the years are expanding from protein folding now to chromosome structure and understanding of how these fundamental biological mo uh, molecules really shape their function and properties. And at the end, this translates in a fundamental understanding of how life, life works and how it evolves. Um, just to give you a quick summary of some of these uh, major um, awards and honors. is a member of the National Academy of Science of the US since 2006, and is really the recipient of many prizes. Just to mention some of the, the most recent one, it was awarded a Max Delbruck Prize in Biological Physics in 2020, uh, uh, sorry, 2019, and 2020 is a member of the Pontifical Academy of Science. So he can go to Rome quite, quite often. And in, in, from 2023, so this year, he was awarded the Founders Award by the Biophysical Society. So uh, I think his insight in all this problem is really fundamentally a revolutionary in the field of, of biophysics, because it's really, for me, it's, that's where I start, what I did when from since my PhD was to start working on, on this understanding of protein folding. So it's really a pleasure for me to uh, introduce you, Jose Onucic, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I think we walk down here a little bit. Uh, yes. Rest and <laughs> stay up here. So I... Thank you for, for coming. I will tell a little bit about, uh, about uh, protein folding and coevolution. And basically, half of the talks are old story, just to bring to the speed. So basically, I always repeat on all made the power of repetition so people really get what's behind it. And part of some new stuff that we have been doing with it. And there's lots of new interesting stuff that probably in the near future get a lot of stuff, stuff interesting stuff getting with Ivan, <laughs> getting done on coupling these ideas to protein design. So if you have a look, the idea behind, uh, behind the protein folding funnel is that basically, if you think about, if you could have all the possible configurations in a protein structure. And uh, let's make sure you have the right one, yes. And basically what this figure tells you is the width of this funnel is the number of states you have, like the log of number of states, something we call the configuration entropy. So you have a lot of states that are disorganized and they come down in energy until the final folded basin. Right, but what you have is a strong correlation between order and energy. It's this correlation between order and energy that gives this idea of the funnel. That means when the protein gets folded, it doesn't make too much difference where it, it gets funnel. So this is what happens in biology. If it was not like that, proteins not be robust folders, and you wouldn't go to a very interesting situation. So the net idea that you have here, and I want to raise to people here, is the old original funnel paper. But the basic idea when you say that, that's basically the interactions that make the protein native, they tend to be attractive. And the interactions that are non-native tend to be repulsive. It doesn't mean they are all attractive, all repulsive, but on average, that's what happens. You have to have a strong bias. Actually, I, you can tell you that you have about 30% uh, interactions attractive on the native state, 30% neutral, and even 30%, that's enough to give you enough bias. 
to win against the other states you are competing against. What makes this problem very complicated is that you're optimizing a ratio. You are basically, at the same way you are trying to make your native state more energetically accessible, you're trying to make the states against it more repulsive. So it's really a ratio. So you have to be very careful not to over-design and then suddenly you start to design the traps with it. But this idea came for a long time and that created an idea of what we call the ideal funnel or the structural-based models or the goal models, depending on what you talk about, that what happens is if I do a model for a protein where I make all the native interactions attractive and all the unknown native, you, you're not going to get the precise energetics, but you're going to get all the configuration states. You can do a lot of design. You can understand about the folding mechanism. You can understand about the barriers. They're mostly entropic. So these structural-based models became very good in order to get the system to do it. So I'm just presenting here a few things here. This work that base has been done on the group by basically many people, but the top people maintain our software. Now it's Paul Whitford and Jeff Noel that's in Holland. Paul is a professor in Northeastern University and came with this idea that basically the peripheral structure based models are, are the limiting case. A force field completely specific to a native configuration and that's not the reality, but you get the states, the configurations, and how the protein get organized, which states come first, which states come later, they, they, they have done it. The first structural-based model to show that this was possible for proteins was actually done by Cecilia Clement. They'll be here next month or in July or something like that. Based Cecilia was a postdoc of the group. She was the first one to do, and I think uh, uh, the original, the original paper on that, and she's the one that created these ideas of. Uh, getting things uh, moving together into, into that direction. So that means that the field of protein fold, if you have structural-based models, you can understand how proteins fold, you can understand how they bind other proteins, you can understand the different states. The problem is, in order to do that, in order to do that, you have to have the structures. And believe it or not, we still have a very limited amount of structures. That's why the entire idea of people, crystallographic structures can only get things that are crystals. You're getting a lot of these cryo EM these days. But still, if you have states that are just uh, usually, uh, that are not completely stable, they're just functional state, they're just uh, intermittent, it becomes very hard to see it. So how do you go there? How do you get this structural information? Because in order to get these force fields, or unless you can do predictions. If you're going to use real physical force fields, you can do for just very small proteins. And then you have the entire structural prediction field on the side that, that will talk a little bit about it. And there is now the field of protein design, what Ivan is talking about, how much we understand this landscape in such a way we can predict all these structures, we can design new structures, become a big game on how you put all this together into, into this structure. So with that in mind, I want to say that basically what I just told you, that basically how do you get this idea? You have funnel and the potential structural-based models are good enough, but you need the structures. And uh, this became a very interesting question. The idea of coevolution became a very successful mess. And actually, coevolution is in the heart of why AlphaFold is working. Basically, that tells you that uh, people believe you can predict everything, but unless you have enough sequences people were able to do, they have done a very good job. I'll comment about it as, as, as they come along so people get a feeling what's on the heart. It's fantastic engineering on AlphaFold, but really something where they really abused and used in a good way all the physical ideas out there to get, uh, to get the system going. So, so this idea comes on a very simple idea that basically Ivan could tell you that better than I can, that uh, for a given structure, you have many more sequences that fold that structure. The space of sequence is much, much larger than the space of structures that you have out there. Okay, if that was not the case, you couldn't even think about protein design, right? The fact you have multiple sequence. Here is just an example of very simple helix turn helix motif. And, and I put on this evolutionary tree to see that the same motif appears in many other situations in evolution in complete different species for complete different functions. So it tells you that basically, Nature tried to design with a few pieces, like it's right, try to build whatever machinery they need. But they use these pieces that already exist. Not like uh, for every new machinery, 
you design a new piece, it's much more like you have a stock room of something they learn, nature learn how to do it, and depending on what they need to do, they go to the stock room and try to build something that works for them. So with that idea, tells you that you have many more sequences. Sorry. You have many more sequences <laughs> that with Zoom. You have many more sequences that can that can bring you to a, to, a, to a given structure you can have to that. So if you have these things, you can come with the idea of coevolution. What's a very simple idea, start on the old days, I'll tell about the, 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 main, the main people that actually developed this field. I will tell you there are two postdocs that were postdocs at that time. That base was for Marcus, that's in Dallas now, and Martin Waite, that's now in Paris. No? In Paris, that's in Paris now. And uh, and basically, and Terry Wa, that was a colleague of mine that were across the street, we were trying to think about this problem for a reason. But the idea is the following. If you really agree with my idea of the photo landscape, that based most of the native interactions tend to be attractive, and the ones that are non-native tend to be repulsive. If you give me that, then you're going to notice that basically, if I have a different sequence to fold, it tells you a particular residue that makes a native contact. Let's say I have the green pair. If I mutate this residue, the other one has to have a compensatory mutation to compensate for that, right? Because you want to make that interaction to continue to be attractive. So you cannot just mutate one of them. They have to mutate together to continue to be attractive. So if that's the case, what you have to look for is which pair of residues tend to move together in order to do that. So you see those pairs tend to be conserved, right? So you're not looking for conservation of residues, you're much more looking for which pairs are conserved and as the idea of covariance comes together. So with that idea together, you now look, for example, with the idea try to show here that basically you have this pair RE or this pair, uh, you try to see which of these pairs are conserved and how often they appear and give an idea that basically, if you have this covariance in that place, that's going to give you some idea. So how you do that in practice, okay? If people have work on statistical mechanics on their life, you always use the bag of tricks that you learn in life, and uh, you go after that bag of tricks. So the base bag of tricks is how you do here. Basically, first thing is that helped a lot. For, so first of all, also these ideas people have been talked for a long time, even in our case on the last, basically we start to the first paper on DCA 2009. So now you can say these entire ideas are 14 years old or red, but basically has changed a lot. The number of sequences are available and much more Ideas of how to align sequences. The concept of protein family, a lot of people in bioinformatics have worked a lot on how to align sequence, and there are lots of different tools. You can use your favorite one. Doesn't mean you have to agree, right? But, okay, but the fact of the concept of families and all these things made life much easier. So that, that made the field be successful. So assume you can do good alignment, that itself is already, is already a big challenge when you get into this field. The next thing you do now is, Try to get this data. We're going to do some statistical mechanics of all these things. So the first thing you have to do is to figure out in a particular position what's the density of amino acids you have on that position. Okay, so which amino acids is more frequent there? So you'd expect the base we have 20 amino acids, and there was no preference, would be one over 20 for each one of them, right? This Fi, where here is the probability of a particular amino acid. But actually, you don't have 20. You have 21 because when you do alignment, you have to put insertions or deletions. So in a sense, you actually work with a 21-letter code, not with a 20-letter code, because when you do this alignment, and that tells you just basically what's the local composition that you have. You're going to see how we relate that to physics. These are our numbers. So Matthew Fisher, that was, in my point of view, one of the great statistical physicists of the world, he always told you that basically, Statistical mechanics is the art of counting. It can be very complicated counting, but in the end, it's counting. Okay, so basically you're counting with weights and stuff like that, but it's just counting. The second part, if I want to go co covariance, I want to see which pairs vary together. And here's an example. For example, I can see that for S and P comes together, then you can, how often you see K and L. So now what you do is the probability between two positions on the sequence, right? Which amino acids are there? They're here, I'm going to call these FIJs. And basically, if this is the case I have here with six sequences, you see that uh, the S and the P is two out of six, so that F would be two six, 
Now you do that for a large number of sequences, a large amount, a large amount, so that's, that's how your data comes in. If you're just happy with that data, this term here, just the FIJ, if you just get the P log P of its PIJs, you get the mutual information from the system. But we want to go beyond the mutual information. You want to go because the mutual information doesn't have only pairs that are pair. They have things that interact on the sequence. So what you want to do is to get the real pair for the prime distribution. That requires you to get the global probability distribution. Now remember, I don't have. I don't have all this information. I only have information about the single site and the pairwise term. And I'm going to try to create that. So the game here now is how do I do, do I get the best global probability distribution that's consistent with this data? And that's what we are getting here. Now, if you're a physicist, you see that this problem is solved for you. Okay? Because right there, what you do is you put this data as constraints and you do now maximum entropy, just like everything we do in life, right? So remember that some cases maximum entropy is really correct, right? If I come for you and say that, that for example, I'm going to have a canonical ensemble, you know the only restriction you have is the energy, right? You see your probability is proportional to e to minus e to kt. Everything else you say maximum disorder. States with maximum energy are equally populated. That's what you do here. You don't know if that's right. In the canonical ensemble, you know that's the only constraint. But in this problem here, I don't know if that's the only constraint. So basically, the fact that when I do maximum entropy to get this joint probability distribution, the theorem tells you that's the best you can get, that's the best you can get in this condition. That may not be enough, but we hope that's enough. Now, this problem here, when you do that, you fall to this Hamiltonian, and that's actually like a POTS model. POTS model is like an Ising model, right? Model of spins. But instead of having spins up and down, now you have 21 orientations. Okay? And you can see clearly that, that this term here is like the magnetic field term of the Ising model that tells you which orientation is more likely to be occupied, right? So AI has a more probability, it's like having a field in that direction. And this term here is the JIJ term that comes here into this term. So, how to invert this model into here? Because Farouk and Mork, uh, 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 at that time, this was very expensive. These guys figure out that if you're happy to do a mean field model into this POTS Hamiltonian, you just put the average spin on the average of all spin, he figured out that this problem, this inference problem, that's a nightmare on your life to do it, actually can be met on just on the inverse of this matrix. And that became a big game. Ivan can give you an entire lecture about pseudo counting and the problems about inverting matrix, but this is a problem that affects everybody has to invert the low density matrix, and uh, but became a problem that became mathematically doable. Now you could go to large systems, right? They show that based this covariance matrix here between this term, that's the basically the pairwise just com compared to these things, and you see that basically became a, a something very easy to compute and became a big game to do it. And then, if you have these terms here, then you're in good shape because now you can figure out what's the likelihood of particular contact to exist. So you come now from these terms and you just get the pairwise likelihood of a contact, the PIJ direct that you get from this Hamiltonian. And when you have this PIJ direct, you can add them for all possible pairs that you have here of amino acids and you get this DIJ. That's pretty much P log P as you expected, just normalized by these FIIs of FJ. And basically, if you take this direct and just get the FIJs, through FIJ here and FIJ here, you get the mutual information. So that's why I call that basis the same quantity, this DI. Now there are the Strobinius norm that people have been used. There are many other things people have been used to do this, but the idea is just to compute which pairs are more likely to exist, and you can identify these things. This is an amazing system, really worked better than we expected. It's becoming very successful. And uh, I will tell you that unfortunately, this problem here is we did quite well in the past, getting this sequence alignment here. And, uh, but it's very complicated sequence alignment because you want to pay 
parts that only vary, parts that conserve you want to remove. We do very simple things. We do a cutoff on them, make the sequencer at least 80% different. We can actually do that to a very sophisticated. Okay, using this method, this alignment, and figure out which sequence should be there and how to count them. Alpha Fold people spent $8 million on that. Okay, and they did a fantastic job that we see it because we look at our results and then we just go up there, curate database for that, and, and does much better. So, it tells you that basically, on this field of machine learning, if you have good engineering together with good physical models, these are the cases are successful. That's why people keep telling people that. Protein folding, protein structure prediction is one of the best success of AI these days. Yes, because we have great AI together with some physical ideas that drive what to actually to put to learn, right? It's not something that you just put a stupid network that came from nowhere. And now you let the system go random, you actually put constraints on it that help to do it. And they are going to be the first one to tell you that. And uh, I think it's a great story of things coming together. Now, the beautiful part about it basically is that at that time we got two other people that basically uh Joanna that's now in in back in Poland and Alex Shug that now is Yulish uh that have got into this problem and they really got into the structural prediction part of this problem and uh, one of the interesting things that came from this work is on this figure here for some reason this box got there in the wrong place but just to have an idea what we got, you got it is every contact into protein. Here, there are many, many families of proteins. Here's just one I'm going to comment about it. Here are sort of about uh, 131 families, and we just plug all these contacts there. And what tells you is we are getting here the top, uh, the top 30 contacts predict for each of these families, and we figure out what was their distance, the real protein. Are we actually predicting the native contacts? So if we look at these things here, it's an example that tells you here that basically red contacts are correct contacts, greens, what you, you may call wrong predictions. You see that basically GI does much better than mutual information. Both do reasonably well, but it's not only you get many more correct, the red ones are incorrect, but they get them more distributed all over the protein. That's what you need for prediction. One of the great things I want to tell you about structural prediction is the following thing. If you can predict long-range contacts, if you get about 30% of them correct, you're done. Because there, there are not too many ways you can put the polymer together. So you figure out, right? So basically, you actually, it's not like you have to be perfect. It's like because the polymer really helps you to do that. So that's why these things became very powerful in structural prediction. But what's interesting about it, that's something that the, the question is, how much are you happy with the result and how greedy you are? If you look at these things here, you have these contacts, most of them are about five angstroms. This is a direct contact between atoms come together between two groups, that's predict. There is this one about eight, eight and a half angstroms. These are the water separate contacts. You have, I mean, we ask them together, but they have a water in between. So these are native contacts. But damn, how about this tail here? Is this just mistake? And we got even more curious, why do you suddenly, when you get 20 angst, you have another jump of high values of the eye? Are these just mistakes? So you can say, you say oh, be happy, you're getting more than 90% correct, but you want to be greedy. And what I said to people is, why nature will give us such a coevolution signal if these things were not important? So these people got together, Farouk got into the game, we say, let's have a look on this context. Why are these things? Are these really mistakes the masses make that come from sequence alignment for whatever it is? Or there's something interesting that comes from this context? The beauty of it is, just a couple of things for people to remember. If you just do for a structural prediction here, you do quite well. That, that's a very simple first paper <laughs> in 2012, where people said, I will, I will tell you a little bit about it, is that you can, if you know the secondary structure, here we just did an example. That's just what someone told you about the secondary structure. This alpha helix, if you know the secondary structure, you can do predictions of 1.5 angstrom just with the DCA context. What tells you, and the current methods are very good about getting secondary structure, getting local structures. The problem is three dimension. This is a nice map I like to have a look 
because this actually are putting up over a hundred of these contacts. The very light light is the is the crystal structure. So the red dots are the ones that uh, DCA gets correct. This is amazing how well this. A lot of the stuff where they say they're not precise or they're in green, you see they're actually, but they're actually very close of where they should be. There are very few that come out of there and that's the top 100. I'm really trying to push it to the question. So you see the power of equivolution getting these things is actually amazing. Now, when we come to this tail here and basically that figure shouldn't be there, but here you see basically this area that I told you about it. We observe the following thing. Let me give an example. Here is a great example on this case here, where if you come the protein here, if you look at a single protein, these residues are very far apart. When we have the multimer, they come together. So this is how two proteins come together. So it's a contact that needs to be formed, not on the same chain, but in multiple chains. So it tells you if you have a look on these interactions. And this became a very powerful method of predicting dimers and other things. Because now, if you get these residues that are actually very strong in covariance, they may have a reason. Maybe multimerization, maybe functional states, maybe things. So it's basically, you are not going to get everything important by covariance because some things are conserved, something is there. But if you have a strong signal in covariance, a very strong signal, you should think about it. Is there a reason for it? Even if it doesn't satisfy a single structure you have. So that's basically the first case. Another case we got very careful is this case we love. It's one of the first case that did it. It was actually done by Farouk and Biman that's now in Bangalore. Is the following thing. We look, this is this, this, is this protein here that goes basically this D-ribose binding protein that's based opening and closing. In blue and red here is the blue is the crystal structure. This is a case where you have the two crystal structure. And the red has the, the additional context of when the structure gets closed. Okay, so the structure, so these are all the contexts of the crystal structure. The blue is just the open one. When you get closed, you get a few additional contexts they're showing here. Then we did the DCA. So you see in green, you do quite well on the open structure. <laughs> if you look in red, we do quite well on getting these parts here that are from the closed structure. But then we got this extra box. So it means the DCA now has a few more contexts that are neither on the open structure, right? You don't have anything on where this box here is here. So now if I do a model, whether I do a structural based model or I put all the contacts that come from the CA as attractive and I run my system with that thing. What I observed actually, we got three minima on this space. We got what they call the closed one. This is the MSD to close, the MSD to open. So clearly, this is the closed state. You get the open state here. But you get this twist state. That means when this protein is folding, you're going to see here, actually goes, but there's a twist before the ribose comes in and comes out. That thing had been proposed before on some theory calculations by Andy McKenna on simulation, some experiments from NMR, that you had the twist state. And we get this exactly from the same. It doesn't mean we predict anything. We haven't predict anything. We just explore the data. Evolution is give you this information, right? Basically, it's not like I did a theoretical prediction. I just went after the data and I said, if I do a model, okay, if I do a model where I try to make all these all, all these interactions here to be attractive, what do I get? Right, the model tells me I have a thirty state. So that's a love. Uh, that's a lovely case where you observe that you can obtain this information, everybody's happy and tell you that basically you have this additional space. So it becomes a great story because when you look at evolution, not only you can predict structure, but on things where you believe you know the structures, if you got additional contacts, they may be there for some functional reasons or some additional structure have to live together and the system is give you that. So this, this is the sort of a old story. That's a story that's about by now, 
eight up to up to eight years ago, and they have been. I think that is what made this field very successful and people very happy. But there's lots of other things you can do. The question is, if you really want to be greedy, is can I go after problems that we know crystal loggers not going to be able to do all the way? So as people know, we have been very interested in chromosome folding, chromatin structure. And one of the main, uh, okay, here, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going a little bit too early. Let me just, I should know, I'm not looking at my slide there. Here's a case, of, uh, just to tell, when you have pairs of residue, when you have two proteins coming together and you try to find protein binding, I'm sorry about it. I'm going to get the other one a little bit here. Here's a typical case in bacteria where you have a lot of these response regulators controlled by kinases. And they're all very similar, how you identify the proper partner. The question you can do that, and this is one case, but there are many other cases. So what you try to do here is you try to do, now instead of having a single sequence, you try to put the two partners together. And you align now this, what we call the super proteins and try to figure out not only the context of a single protein, but the covariance of residues coming together. The difficulty of this problem here, actually Martin Waite is doing a beautiful work on that. The difficulty of this problem here is that you have to figure out which pairs come together when you have this many different things. In bacteria, it's very easy. Because in bacteria, these partners tend to have, to have the same operon. So you know which are the two proteins to come together. You assume they're coming from the same operon. When you come, try to do that on different species, like different vertebrates and stuff like that, it's a more difficult thing. How do you put species to, you can bring same species, but sometimes same species in multiple copies. Marty Waite has created a beautiful way of trying to align these things, but the bottom line is you can get many partners. This is a difficult problem. However, like I said, one problem that has been tremendous and based a lot of good work came out, actually the original DC paper that came out was done by Alex Shug. This is one of the cases that tells, this is a lot about this basically. We got that structure with DCA for the first time, was the first thing we were doing you need, so you keep checking, you keep checking. By the time we published, the crystal structure came on the same issue that we did. We could have six months before the, the crystal structure came as a, as, a, as a first theoretical prediction, but you know, it's one of these things, how early you wanna publish things. And it's an interesting story, that's how the field started. That's the first paper, that's how the field actually start, is the is, is a very interesting story coming together. Now, for dimers, like I told you, it's great, because for dimers, you have no problem, because dimers is the same sequence. So what you're looking for is which pairs satisfy the monomer, and which pairs are don't. And remember, a lot of the dimers in nature are very unstable. They just live for a short time. And the most of, the, a lot of base, 70% protein-protein interaction in, in, in your system come on dimers. And here, all you have to look is basically, you have to do the DCA and figure out which contacts are strong here that are not, that do not participate on the monomer. If they are, you can put a few other links when they're the surface and basically, we have done a great job on, on, getting, on getting these structures together. There's a lot of, there's a great review on that based. People are using that on dimer prediction. It's one of the very success, it's very easy to do because you don't have to do the super protein families. You just have to do a single family and figure out which the contacts that are that are there that are, do not live on the monomer, right? It's a fantastic thing. Now, actually, I can come to the Chromosomes. Uh, this was, work was done by Donna Krapel. She's in Israel now, and I run this running, is in San Francisco, running a lot of biotech companies that be working together. There is this gigantic protein, what they call condensing or cohesin, what they call the structure mantis chromatin proteins, motors. These are these motors that bring these things together. But these things are really gigantic things. And we got together with people and say, can we, put, can we predict the structure of these objects? And people are very curious. These things bring two pieces of DNA together. They are a single ring, there are two rings, how they came together, and what's the game we played? So the game was played the following way, okay? Uh, just for people curiosity here, these proteins tend to create something what they call extrusion. They keep pulling these things and making these loops. That's how you condense 
the chromosome, right? The chromosome gets very condensed by doing these things together. And that's how these proteins work with these motors. Now, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about it, but we, the way we play the game is the same thing I told you before. We align the sequence, you do the multiple alignment. And now what people have is few people have been working on these proteins. They're awfully important. Crystallographers have been doing it for a long time, but they just have little pieces. So in orange is what we learned from crystallography. Here you're trying to put uh, these big proteins together. Here's the hinge. Here the big the the the, the uh, here's the large uh, proteins here. The condensing here is basically the glycines that come from the bottom and tend to be the active part of these proteins put together. This top part here are just basically major coil coils that come together, are put in together. So the orange is what you get from a small piece that crystallographers are able to put together. So the next step you do it, and base that gives you what you call naive context, you're seeing through crystallography. Now, what do you do now? You apply DCA. Now it's just beautiful, right? Because the DCA fills up this entire map. You can use the, the crystal structure here just to see the base. You can actually do quite well. You can predict quite well. And they give this thing. But now you can see, you can see the coil coils coming together. See, there are two coil coils. You can see the, the interaction of the coil coils. This is give you the entire structure. But more than anything else, give the interaction, all these proteins come together. This SSPB, this SSPA, coil coils together with the large SMC proteins they're putting together. So now you can predict the structure. So what happens, basically, after you do that, now you have this say, you believe on it, you keep pushing forward, and now you can do a structural-based model with this context, and then you can simulate and try to figure out what's the final structure you got for the system. So that's the game that was played. And there are several things that were learned, basically. Observe here that basically you talk about uh, 3,000 amino acids is based a very large system. Right, you're putting this together. Just for people curiosity, I'm trying to remind here, these things are kind of 30 nanometers long. I'm just compared to a nucleosome. That's about 10 nanometers, right? So see how large this protein is. <laughs> so the first thing that happens is when you look at this interaction between these proteins, SSPA and SSPB, what they come from this <laughs> uh, then I was able to figure out from this interaction that in order to satisfy this contact here, let me see if I have the next slide. No, 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 no I don't want to let's, let's take it back. First thing, I'm sorry. First thing she did here, I'm sorry, it's here, is to figure out that in order to satisfy this context, you actually had a trimer here. SSPB, two SSPB and one SSPA. So you didn't have two rings with each one would have one SSPV, one SPVA, you, you have that. How does she know that? Because she can figure out how to satisfy the context on that region. So she was able to solve the stoichiometry, the problem to say you had a single ring with a stoichiometry of two SSPAs, SSPV and one SSPA. So it's a great thing for the glycines. And now you can try to figure out how the motors work. That's something you're working on now. And you are able to get this structure down here. The other interesting part that she had, she decided to look at this hinge. The hinge area, there is some crystal structure the hinge. So you come on this hinge area and you look at this very careful, just this area on, on from the map here, the hinge area here, you start to observe the following thing. What you observe is basically the DCA gives a lot of context on this area that actually comes on this brown stuff from the crystal structure people had when they had the closed structure, we predict quite well this area and this area here. However, we had another box that has very few contacts and lots of DCA contacts. So what you do, basically, you build for this area, you have your structural-based models you can run. And when you run the structural-based models for that, what you observe is actually, in order to satisfy all these contacts, you had the closed structure satisfied here, and you have an open structure here that satisfies these contacts. So using DCA, we don't only get the closed structure you're supposed to get a say, but you can see that this motor can open and close in order to get DNA to go in. 
And the beautiful part is that if you look this open structure, it was predicted. You can look, for example, that the charge, all positive here, create a cleft where the DNA is all negative to come in. Right, so these are beautiful things that tells you that you find this binding pocket and you can see the power that you come these things together by creating a structural based model, not only structural prediction, but predict functional states and getting there and get this very gigantic protein and, and get these things. Now, this game is really increasing these days. It is basically, we have been, we have been working with Peter Wallens and all people on that comparing now I won't, I won't do too much because I don't want to annoy you guys too much basically we have been condensing and cohesing comparing these things as we are doing with Ivan now with physical models with design potentials see how the DCA predictions come together and what you're noticing is a more interesting part is that these coils come together they can form very isomers they can twist around and they can come in there so with this potential we're looking for this twist and up here these motors are much more like a rotating motors the way you do these things, you're not pulling these things about. You're rotating this DNA and bringing it together. That's a speculation. That's something you're doing together. The other thing that appears to be is we can play with this structure. It looks like you have these multiple isomers that are twisted. And we are just looking at some experiments that people are getting. They're trying to get a structure. They never got a good structure that agree with experiments because we have shown that basically actually on these experiments, people are done on this cohesion here. You actually need multiple isomers to satisfy the data. So it appears that you have these twisting motors acting there all the time. And it's another speculation that's coming on how these things work and are putting this, this, this together. And so now, basically, I just want to finish this part here with this idea to think you can think about these motors are actually more like they're not handcuffed, they're much more like braids moving these things around, right? As you're moving on these chromosomes. These are very interesting story how these motors work. Nobody knows the details. So you're we're now working with our people moving towards that direction. <laughs> One thing we're very interested with Ivan now on protein design is the idea that basically, if you become really greedy, you not only predict contacts, but you look at these energies and try to give a, a physical meaning for the energy. You see, if a pair happens more often, it's a real pair. Right? You have to be very careful of that because you can very easily start to run out of data. Okay, so basically it becomes a very interesting story. Now, what you observe is these things do quite well for pairwise interactions. That means you, you really want to do this comparison for a family because you get different families. Proteins may have different collapse level. They may have different fold base, but for the same family, you expect mutations on the same family work well. So can you start to explore mutation just by being greedy and look at this term and give you a real meaning for that? And the amazing thing is here are six different families and you do that what delta delta G that comes from DCA compared with the delta G experiment. They correlate better than any method that's computed free energy detail on just mutation work. Doesn't mean we're doing better. Nature is doing it. We are just extract the data. That's what I want to highlight from here. Here we just get evolution data, and you're put using this mass of covariance to explore this data. It's amazing how well you do it. Okay, and when you put all this together, when you put all this together, and you try to bring it, it becomes even more interesting because here is we got one particular family. Here's the PDZ family that actually. It's one of the families that Ivan is trying to design these days because you want to compare the design sequences with the natural sequence. A beautiful work I think is happening now. We have the chance to do while doing my stay here. And Ivan is working on that. Is basically what you observe here is we're comparing the energy of this DCA that I'm getting here compared to a physical force field, this awesome force field, something Peter Wallace has developed. They correlate quite well. The nice thing here is if I put all the sequence that fold the same structure with this energy, they have this low energy state here. Now, if I get my same sequence and I start to randomize my amino acids, right? Just by shuffling them around, you get states with the same structure, but you get what you call this molten globular state, this collapse state of the energy. So they separate quite well. We have this temperature here that comes from that slope here. We call KT select. And what that means is. This is not a real temperature. This is a temperature 
in sequence space. What you could imagine is the temperature can diminish that base as, as evolution is going around and it's doing mutations and creating new sequences. They may have to take a few ones high energy, otherwise you just get local in trap. So the question is how much you allow, nature allows you to get out of your stable state to go out. It's like Monte Carlo in sequence space, right? And this temperature is not a real temperature. It's just a sampling temperature. But it's a very interesting temperature that comes out uh, for the Z pattern is about 124 Kelvin, but it is, it's, these things tend to be for most sequence between 100 and 180. So it's an interesting number that's appearing now to tell you how much evolution, how much flexibility has evolution as they're moving around. Why evolution cannot use high temperature? Because there's one major thing in evolution, you cannot die. Right, should die, you're over. If a species is developing and you hit a mutation that's fatal, you're out of the game, right? So basically, which is the typical temperature they believe you can still create these things to be functional and you can sample as, as we evolve around. So I just wanted to finish with one simple example here in terms of functional things. Uh, I told you a little bit before about uh, about uh, the work about these pairs of proteins interact together, basically that the cysteine kinase together with these response regulators coming together. One of these, basically, remembering bacteria, this is what a lot of how the, the basic decision making is made on bacteria, right? These things that process information by getting different ions, different food, and they just figure out what to do. These things are sensing. This 4Q, 4P is a work done by Matt Laub at MIT, and that's just a magnesium detector. They just figure out the level of magnesium around. So you're going to see if it gets too much magnesium, it doesn't get to go in and just control the magnesium. So what you have is this, this kinase that binds to this response regulator for P, and you're controlling it here. And they do a phosphate transfer. That's how the entire signal pathway comes down. Now, what's very cool is there's a big binding area with four amino acids. And Matt Laube decided one of these high throughput experiments. They got these four residues and they mutate every residue by every possible residue. So in a sense, you get 160,000 total amino acid variants. The beautiful part about these experiments, why you got very curious about it, is that basically about 1% survives. And 99% dies. They are non-functional, okay? So it's a nice experiment because you have all this data. Okay, it's not ideal because it doesn't tell you which one is better or worse. It just tells you live or die, right? But it's enough for you to think about it. What can we do with that? If I just do the same things and I compare these things with my energy potential, I told you about it. How much do I believe on it? Now I can look at that in about 160,000 pairs. The results here are very nice. And I think I want you guys to think about it Basically, uh, uh, Ryan Shang that did his work is still now doing it as a major project on this direction. But he observed the following thing. We did all these mutations, okay? And uh, these are all the different, uh, this is for Q4P. And these are all the other different response regulators that are in that bacteria. Okay, what's the problem? When I do a mutation, and I want to be functional, I hope it to bind equally strong or, or better. But also, I want to avoid not to bind better to the other ones. Because the idea here is you only for Q to bind to 4P much better than bind to everything else. Right? So it's just not optimizing this pair here, it's optimizing this pair and anti designing the other pairs. Okay, so if I go back one slide here, tells you that basically you want to make binding better to the one you want, but also you want to increase the specificity you want, but you want to decrease to the other, to the competition. So it's a dual game. You have to do it. And the nice thing what Ryan did on this work is the following thing. When he got, <clears throat> when he got basically these things, zero was the wild type. Lots of things got worse in energy, right? And when look this tail, you see, about 80% of this tail is actually doing well. So I say, let's see, with this method, I can actually predict with 80% precision, but I actually can do much better. When you go out and say, 
I'm also going to do that, but also I'm going to remove the crosstalk, the ones that bind stronger to the other ones. Then so you can see that the top 50, it has 100% prediction. So it's basic. So you use this energy for two things. Don't compare only to this one. You compare to all your competition. And you figure out that you improve the one you want, but you are not getting the other one. And I think this is a very, very nice result that tells you how the things come together. If you have the full information, the system tells how biology works, tell how things come together, and tell how all this, oh, all this game is put together. So I just want to finish with two slides of a very recent paper by a student Green that just graduated. And what Corinne was doing is Figuring out, I, I could go to details, this paper is very confused, but Korea is trying to figure out at which level of the I, that P log P, I can believe that I get a real contact. I, I'm really convinced that my results are correct. And basically, he has this DI of 0.3 that's made that cross the 80% of success rate. So basically, if it's more than that, you have to be careful. The question is how much are we willing to live with false positives, right? Now, the beautiful thing of these things tells you, as expected, one thing that makes life difficult because you're dealing with data. When you're doing structural prediction of a monomer, a single monomer of a protein, you see that basically you have lots of contacts above that threshold. Clear, and most of the contacts are down here. But if you get your top context, you have lots of top contexts. So I put a threshold of 0.3. With these things, I can predict any structure. When I come to dimers, these numbers tends to be much smaller. Right? So basically, now we create a criteria to say, OK, we love DCA. We love covariance. And why I put these things here is that basically, why alpha fold fails sometimes? If you don't have data, you go nowhere. You cannot push the system to, no matter how good your engineering is, no matter how crazy you are, if you don't have it. So that's something that's actually a very interesting story that basically has been some case where base, that basic, oh, alpha fold fail enormously. And in most of these cases, we almost could predict it. it's not their fault. It's just that base, there's not enough data for that thing. If you don't have enough covariance, you're going to run into trouble. And I think this criteria that, uh, yeah, he did. I just want to have one more slide. I can go on details here, but I don't want to annoy you too much. Here is just showing that basically you have for dimers has much less of these things coming together. Here is for the monomers. And I just want to show that basically as 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 you start to see the signal is you have this threshold, and you can see the difference, right? Based monomer, dimer, monomer, dimer. And what I'm hearing blue and red tells you for families, when the number of effective sequence, you have this quantity, and F is the number of effective U6 over the length of the protein, right? So for if you think about proteins about B300 amino acids, give this famous number about 1,000, you want this number to be larger than one, right? To have enough effective sequence to actually predict you see that you do you do much better. Basically, you do much better for the monomer. The dimer you do worse, but you see, it's small. You still do okay for monomer, but you completely fail for dimers. So not having enough sequence to really destroy your life. And uh, the final thing is cases where you have good results far from what you expect to be that tells about alternative structures. So it's a big game that basically is being played in a sense of based how much can we believe the data on that. So with that, I think I'm going to stop here. I think I already have been talking for long enough. I want to thank the people uh, that helped me doing this work. Basically, I have a fantastic group of former postdocs and professors in many places. Uh, I love the people that ask me to say that basically if you travel so much, who does the work when you're traveling? I always say it's the same people who do work when I'm not traveling. So it's basically not that all that would be possible. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. <clears throat> um, so I think we can open the floor for questions. I'm not sure how I can check the questions online, maybe through Jose's computer, maybe directly. So if you want to start asking a couple of questions, I will have a look okay. on the Zoom account to see if anybody's asking questions. Um, 
you have to get out of the talk. It's the first thing I think you have to escape, right? Yeah. Get I, out I was I wanted to avoid to do that. But, well, I actually have a, a, a question, unless somebody already thought what question they wanted to ask. Um, when you uh, said the, um, the prediction of the different structures from the DCA uh, contacts, what you see in the simulation of different conformation, this is putting all the contacts at the same time together? Or yes, yes. We, write a, we write a Hamiltonian. In structure based, do we do it? We write a structure based on Hamiltonian, where you put the tertiary contacts, they're not the ones that come from the quick structure, they won't come through DCA. Right? And then I run the Hamiltonian with the same en energy function and I see which structure is getting there. So you, you put full phase on DCA and uh, you have you have full phase on DCA, and then you just run it. And the, and when we do it, we run not assume you have a single structure. We try to, we run a long simulation, and then we do clustering to figure out how many minima you have into into that system, and the system tells you where you are. So I think it's a very easy way to do it. That's what we do exactly for the other systems, because we don't want to bias the system to tell you I want a single structure. We just run. These are very inexpensive simulations. That's a beautiful part about structure-based models. You just run this long simulation, and then you cluster with see which how many how many bases you are visiting. Okay, that that's that's yeah, very interesting in itself because it suggests that basically this group of contacts are sort of always there in the energy landscape, and there is some just something that when the protein needs to change the uh, equilibrium from one configuration to the other one, it doesn't really have to restructure a lot. The contact is just a little shift in waiting which contact will dominate because officially the protein will choose one structure. Exactly. One so what you're saying is something that we are learning and it becomes very clear. If you have a protein like an enzyme, an enzyme tends to fold to a given structure, wants to go there, have a very precise structure. They have what you call perfect funnel. You have a signaling protein that has to live between three structures. They have a few pair of contexts that none of them can be satisfied all the time. So there's always some residual frustration. One or the other depends on the structure. So these things are just competing among them. And what you can see is that small things, so you live between these two states, small things like an ion binding or another small part is enough to switch the equilibrium to them, right? So you want these things to be very close in energy, just a few KT in difference where a few things can just twist you between them. So you can look at that. The same way that basically we are looking, I'm just going to a different talk with the idea of frustration. If you look proteins here, for example, after you fold them and you write, write you find this frustration I told you to figure out the level of frustration, you can find regions that are frustrated and they're probably identified binding regions when something else binds gets happy, right? So basically, so lots of ways of basically a lot of deviations from ideal funnel are associated to functional situations. When the protein is not leaving on a single structure. But that's the beautiful part because you make a single phone assumption and then you see where you deviate and you use that deviation not as a negative, but a way to tell that's a signal that something else is taking place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess you, you've spoken a bit about dimers and how coevolution also uh, encodes uh, information about dimers, but you mentioned that many dimers have actually a, quite a low stability. Their binding affinity is not great. So I, I was wondering if the, there, has, there has been any attempt to do a mapping between strength of coevolutionary signal and binding affinity, something quantitative about thermodynamics. We haven't done it. There's much more data than what Ricardo did that. It's a very good idea. But that's a very interesting question that you're asking, okay? It's an it's a amazing question because you have to think about it. You always have the idea that if something is important, it has to bind better, <clears throat> okay? And a lot of system, you actually don't want to bind very strong. In a lot of systems based on a lot of signaling proteins, you want to be there and get out because you want to have the system open because they're sort of, you're just a sensor. You want to sense, do something, but then you want to get out and see if something's changed. You don't want something to bind there forever and be there. So that creates a very interesting question for you're asking is that basically, I may have a pair that's very important for signaling, 
Covariance is going to tell you that pair is required for signaling, but they're not very, very energetically strong. So the idea you have of trying to figure out this correlation between function, strength, and covariance is that I'm very important. We haven't done it. We, we are trying to do now because now we have more enough sequence we can do it. When we did that, we didn't have that many sequence to actually do see. But your idea is very, very interesting to figure out how much, it, because there is this sort of idea in the world that function and strands of binding are together. In some cases, that's absolutely true. But in some cases, that's not the case. So to really investigate that in a quantitative manner is well point. And your comments is well taken because that's not a qualitative question, it's a quantitative question, mm -hmm. right? So the question is not something, it's not like a yes or no question, but it's a very interesting thing to figure out. Uh, and then, because remember that uh, evolution just care about living and dying, right? So in a sense, it's basically, so in a lot of sensing and stuff like that, there are lots of interesting that goes on that regard. You don't, you may not want things to be very strong binders. You just want these proteins to come so what's interesting is we have proteins. We, we, we have a few ad hoc examples. That's why I don't want to make a conclusion. A protein is that actually you know that dimer is very important, but energetic, they're very weak mm -hmm. because they just have to do for a short time. So people never have a crystal structure, but people know that they are functionally important. But these are, okay, I can take one example from my right pocket and one example from my left pocket. That's not a question in sort of what the way you're asking. Can you actually fully quantify this problem that would be a very useful thing in terms of designing and understanding all the process. I think it would still work because if, if mutations work as temperature, these weaker binding but functional should be having a different temperature, it should be warmer they may, they, than, the, than the very cold and stable, say, so, uh, so, pairs. So, uh, so I made a statement here, but I didn't explain it because I cannot explain. I told you that if you look this T select, we have seen temperatures varying between 100 and 200. Okay, that's a big jump on how simply. Uh, is there a difference between this? They have a T select higher and a T select above. So there are lots of things basically why they don't have all the same. Why nature, okay? There's no reason why they should have all the same, but we don't have a justification why they are different either. So these are things that are still open questions that we are just basically, a lot of the stuff I'm showing you is stuff you're obtaining from the data, but the physical explanation is necessary. Yeah, yeah I have another one, uh, which is a bit uh, like a detour from the main topic of the okay. Um But I guess that we've seen a lot about like BCA and, 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 and how covariation co actually informs maybe then most, yeah, maybe more than anything else, structure, and you bring the structure-based models into the mix as part of the Hamiltonian, say. Um, so when we don't care about structure, when we care about disorder, how strong do you think that the covariation uh, signal uh, can take us to understand protein disorder? <clears throat> Uh, you know that some people have these PLDDT as predictor of disorder in proteins, but also Julie Forman K has shown us some interesting examples where that actually does not work. Um, so okay, that's okay. 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 So first of all, uh, you know, people know historic. I don't like the term IDP. No, I don't like it, disorder proteins. It's just because I think it creates a folklore that actually tells you there are two things that like, oh, there's order and disorder, like there are two groups of proteins. When actually, when it comes to disorder world, there's a continuum of process that somehow we are trying to explain the entire continuum. I, I joke with people like say, we have linear problems and nonlinear problems. Like the nonlinear can be anything and disorder can be anything. So that given, so it's not I'm against it, I think it's a beautiful field. It's just, I don't like the fact that people try to throw everything in one package. Now, with that said, is the following. What we are doing here, and Peter is doing a little bit more than I am, and the people are starting to do results, the following. You may have disordered proteins. That are, that you observe that they are disordered. But they tend to get ordered as they become functional, as they get apart, as they, they may form different things. So the interesting question is, if this protein now forms a particular structure when they have a partner, they may have some tendency to fold to that structure. 
but they don't have, but they still, the entropy is still beating you. You need something else to bind. So when you run DCAs on all these disorder proteins, the ones that tend to be on the threshold of folding, they may give you a DCA signal, even so you don't have a structure, because those residues are right there to form together. So what you're trying to do is, can I get now these different families of disorder proteins and now run DCA, try to see if I can get a context and see if these are associated to find the states that come in the future when they get a partner or when they dimerize or when there's some uh, pH change and stuff like that. So in a sense, what you're trying to do is, can we get all these things that are called disordered proteins and try to classify them with a sort of, they still have a tendency of order. On their regular state, they're disordered, but they're not like, they, they just need a little help and they may go toward it. And then we may create a classification of that. So that's a very, that's one of the things we like to do. And we could do it by run DCA, say, do I get a DCA signal and what it means? But this is very preliminary work, but it's a very interesting question. It tells you that basically the signal may be there, even so the protein doesn't have a crystal share, it doesn't happen. So I think this is one of the many cases, I told you a few cases here on things that basically don't have a structure associated, or at least there's a structure that you know about it, but you still get a DCAC, what that means. Yes. I don't know what is related. This DCA Hamiltonian is like an effective free energy from the native context. Yeah, this is, this is, when, when I write the structure based on uh, Hamiltonian, I have the secondary structure yeah. plus the tertiary context. Okay. okay, but normally I do that coming from a structure structure. Now I do tertiary context. Say these two things are attractive because I saw DCA. So it's the same Hamiltonian I had before. Then I have a full free energy. Then I calculate that. But I have an effect of Hamiltonian, and then I just run like we run the other things before. So you just put the energy term for every contact DCA, you put an energy term with the typical term that you have on, on. What you observe is that basically, a very interesting thing is you can get quite well on, on data by putting a typical tertiary interaction of the order of a kilocalorie per mole. That's a typical number. The numbers may vary between half and three, but if you put one, you don't change the structure. So the way you do it, just put one kilocalorie mole between just two things and them together and keep running the model. And because we know that for real proteins, when you have crystal structure, they give you more or less. They may not be precise, sometimes they do, but it's a very good starting point for it. So you say, I assume these contacts are attractive. What's very nice is if you have too many contacts, many structures, this contact cannot be satisfied all at the same time. So they cannot be satisfied in the same style. They may give you multiple structures. Yeah, but I guess uh, what is an attractive contact in, in this concept of effective Hamiltonian could be, because normally uh, we tend to think about whatever, a hydrogen bond or, or something specific, but perhaps it's entropy oh, no, no. or perhaps it's a solvation. So let, no, 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 uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. So let me tell you two things here. I was actually discussing that with Dan the other day. And that's a fight you have with experiments. Or not fight, it's a good conversation. Mm -hmm. If you really look at protein folding, every number is zero. Okay? You expect that when you are at the folding temperature, the delta G between the folded and unfolded state should be zero, because that's what means to be at the transition. Yeah. But what are you observing in real systems is that delta G is zero, so is delta H, so is delta S. <laughs> okay? So the numbers tend to be very strong, very robust there. So that tells you that basically whatever the entropy is losing entropy, but the solvents gain almost the same amount. To do the, so when I do my models here, this is an effective model. You are 100% correct. On well, my effect model, I have implicit solvation. So my, my, my energy, what I call energy on these models with implicit solvation, that energy includes not only they include basically, they include the delta H for the protein, but they have the delta H for the solvent and the delta S for the solvent. You just leave the delta S of the protein, what you call the conversion entropy as a different part of the simplest model. So, so you're 100% correct. So that's why I can I, I haven't had time, but I can show you basically when you compare all atom simulations with full so with full solvation, when you try to separate the time. This work I did with Hel Garcia, you can actually show these terms. But proteins are very robust because you really, if you look basically, the work that people did, Krivolov and all these guys, is that basically these are very robust systems because you see, you not only have delta S on this sort of minimum, yeah. but you have the delta G, but you have delta H and delta S. It's not like you have 
So when I say, when people say, oh, I have a big energy change, a big entropy change, that's in terms of the protein alone, right? But they tend to be compensated with the solvent on these increased solvation models. Any more doubts? I mean, I think we can also continue afterwards for okay. lunch if you want, but uh, I think we can close the session now. Thank you very much, Joseph, for your talk and Thank you. for everybody here and remotely connected. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yes, I can. I guess that it's not good for this model plus evolution seems to be like a very big match. This, do you recall of any cases where it doesn't work and you have to negatively design against? Yes, even no, you have, what you have is to show that uh, we have cases. Oh, no, when Bill de Grad started designing proteins, mm -hmm. people start to learn of the over designed proteins, the over designed traps, and they never worked. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. So that was the first thing on the first group of. Uh, uh, let me just make sure, yeah. 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 You have to be very careful uh, in your arms. Okay, it's all fine. I guess, I guess that negative design in principle comes from very low uh, probability, pairwise probabilities from the statistics. No? So that's what, what's negatively well, defined in by in default. In the way we do it. We don't even do the, we are just doing selection, right? So what mm -hmm. we do is we look not only the binds to this protein, but we look the binds to all the other competing mm -hmm. And the ones that basically design it does better, but actually binds better the competition. We just eliminated one as not being a good choice, mm -hmm. right? It's different than basically that's the way you do it. Now, if you want to do real uh, negative not design, that. it's very complicated because optimizing ratios is not very simple. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's right. If you try to optimize the F over TG, optimizing ratio. So that's why in our case the design is easy because we design everything. We design how you bind to this one, but how you bind to everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you bind everything, no change, and then I take the result. But if I bind this one, I do well. But what I want to do better, I know that basically this is a case where you have this cross talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't go into details, but you have doing with equal light to look the entire binding things. And there, there's a lot of cross talk going around these ways. And mm -hmm. you just have to be strong enough compared to that. Because that's very, very interesting because you really look at bacteria. Mm -hmm. It's responsible for the bond regulators and kind of they're very similar. So the yeah. idea of creating selectivity, right? To this fossil yeah. transfer to have the right one. They create the network afterwards. Is mm -hmm. a, I guess that millimolar to micromolar, you'd expect anything to be able to bind in that range, no? Uh, so, so, and, and somehow the entire control bacteria is yeah. just done by these things, right? Because that's, that's why that's how they operate, right? And, and, and you may even find that, well, no, there's no possibility of negatively defined because you are not introducing time into the mix. Yeah, of like when you have. Uh, protein, protein is actually being translated, translated which you couldn't yes. design you against just, just by energetics alone. And it's just that, well, and the, things are yeah, the, being expressed, and like even time, and then David, that makes it David, possible. You, no, okay. Uh, okay. Your, your point is well taken, and I really like it. I like that from the conversation as you guys the other day. So it's a very interesting thing to think about. Right? You don't have to. Yeah. 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 The function is a word as an existing physics, okay? Mm -hmm. There's not a function of quantity in physics, mm -hmm. right? So when you get to do physical modeling on biological system, now you're trying to design, define that something, what's the physical process? Mm -hmm. Or well, K-caps, I guess. No, 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 as no as it's whatever it is, associate to function. The simplest thing to do is what people do these days, and actually that's how 90% of the drugs are done. Mm -hmm. That's why 90% of the drugs are inhibitors of enzymes. If you look everything you have there, 
And that's why I think our spectrum of drugs is very small these days because people are very good about designing inhibitor points. We all believe everything is binding, binding stronger, binding weaker, and then we know how to do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So basically, so, but is that because that's the way it should be or that's because the only thing we know how to do it, right? So, so your, your point is well taken. So I think what we are getting these days is that based when you have it into sensory system, binding stronger is not necessarily what you want. Mm -hmm. So now how do you control that, right? Because, uh, uh, because for example, if I have a wound here and you want to put some cytokines to help you, it's good, right? But uh, if the system get out of control, it may not be good for you, right? Like Ivan had a, your own, his own personal experience on the subject. Yes. Mm -hmm when you get this cytokine prizes, right? People had a lot of during COVID, he had a lot of people had all these mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's just the system mm -hmm. get out of control mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you want to do these things, you want to develop a little bit for you to, the, to do whatever the job that has to be done, mm -hmm. but then want to get out of the way, right? So basically it's how you cure the disease before you cure the patient, right? Mm -hmm. Happens with uh, cancer drugs, happen with all, what's the threshold, right? Mm -hmm. so, so your point is well taken. Now, how biology actually do that? I don't think we understand all the mechanisms. So basically, sometimes you want to bind for a short time. Mm -hmm. That sort of creates a process. Mm -hmm. And then that process lasts for some time mm -hmm. and then dies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you don't want some things say, no, no, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, yeah, right? No, so, sure. yeah. so how you actually do these things becomes a view, okay? So that's why some people now are trying to come. That's just K on is important to have some drug design. So you shouldn't be looking at the uh, equilibrium bind. You should look at K on. You're going to find wars into drug design conference. Mm -hmm. Why you should just optimize K on because K off is irrelevant. And uh, so what they say, and actually what we meant is that in many cases, all you care is how fast you get there. You don't want to be stable there, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, so it's a very interesting, I think, but these are all very rudimental, rudimental ideas into very complex problems. Mm -hmm. But I think you're taking these ideas, basically. I think, it, okay, you're dealing with metals. Metals are amazing, right? Mm -hmm. They're necessary, but they can be awfully toxic. So how do you, how do you deal with the entire... Mm -hmm equilibrium of these things, right? Basically, it's like iron, it's a very interesting story. The entire iron situation on your body is like, you, you, you die without it, but if you overdo, you have all the kind of diseases that basically, mm -hmm. you love iron three, but you don't have a, you iron two, but you don't want to be oxidated there, basically you don't want to eat iron, right? it's not be good for you. So mm -hmm. how do you sure. get? Mm -hmm. My experience with negative design is that on average, because of you have, if you have a frustration, frustrated matrix with an mm -hmm. heterogeneous distribution of interactions, and you average interaction of the matrix is zero, mm -hmm. you have that basically uh, random interactions between proteins is zero as well. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you optimize, you don't have to optimize even very hard the specific interactions. And then make it this detached, so a sort of outlier compared to random interaction. So you don't really need to do a lot of negative design mm -hmm. just to avoid spurious interaction, because normally, because of the average frustration coming from this heterogeneous set of interactions, mm -hmm. you just don't get things that interact together. I mean, in, I mean, we tested that in different ways, mm -hmm. and from a statistical point of view. If you have an alphabet of 20 letters, basically things do not interact. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you freeze the system, if you go low in temperature, so you reduce the entropy component, mm -hmm. everything sticks to everything sticks together. Mm -hmm. So I think nature doesn't need to do a lot of negative design because mm -hmm. thermal fluctuations are enough mm -hmm. to break I guess most of most. Maybe maybe the fault switchers may be an interesting no, 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 uh, but... case for knowing. I guess that if you want, if you have a one that I mean would be liking either fold more or less the same uh, no or if you're close to the transition between two different folds uh, through mutations or through variants then you may be able to say okay this would this this sequence would give me 
this percentage of each of them. But if I design against it through something else, I can I can okay. balance the. Well, let me tell you a story here. That's basically I I, I I we wrote a short paper on it. It became very polemic, and uh, we put up an ass always when you have to do this one. Uh, uh, let's tell you a little bit about it. Uh, a lot of stuff in biology, you have to think about it. That. Uh, how much actually people want to be a very economical process and when biology is really to spend a lot of energy to have something that's very efficient and they respond very fast when you need it so i think all these response regulators that's what makes different i don't know when details it happens a pretty different way if you look at these bindings these things are very similar the first thing you ask is 